Do we believe in hell? In certain faiths, if you don't have the right belief, you're going to go to hell. And you're going to have not only go there, but it'll be in eternal damnation because you didn't believe. By us, is it belief that brings you to hell? If you have the right belief, you believe in God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You believe in the Jewish God. But um, you do something that's not so good. You ate something not kosher. You said something not nice. You engage in in thoughts that are uh, areas that are not appropriate. But you believe. You're a believer. So isn't that going to save me from purgatory? Some good questions. I'm Rabbi Ronnie Fine coming to you from Chabad Zichron Kedeshim, where it's a privilege and a pleasure to share with you Tanya today. And today, there'll be a double portion from yesterday from Shabbos and from today's class, Sunday. We are in chapter 8. The entirety of chapter 8 speaks about that which is prohibited. And how does it affect an individual? What you, you do something that's prohibited, or you say something, think something, but your intent was positive. I don't know, okay, let's say action. Better in action, the idea. You ate something that's not kosher, but with that, you actually use that non-kosher, and this is for, a, by the way, only a Jew has to eat kosher. If someone isn't Jewish, they have no, uh, no mitzvah to eat kosher. I mean, of course, you could if you want, but no obligation. And with you ate it with the intent to serve God, that non-kosher, no. BLT. You 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 did it. Per, maybe that's a good example because I think people uh, you know might do that out of lust. But whatever it is, you ate it with the intent to have energy to serve God to come and learn Tanya right now, right? So. Isn't it about your intent in, in the service of God and therefore this should be okay? That the energy of that food is now giving you the capability to focus properly to study? So the answer is no. Why? Because as we've explained, excuse me, get some air in here. As we've explained, that something is prohibited in the Hebrew, the terminology is usr. Usr means it's tied, bound to extraneous negative forces. Sholish klipas atmeus, the three completely unholy forces, and it can't be elevated. I mean, we speak, we spoke about what you can do afterwards in the tshuva and so on in the previous chapter. But even if the intent is to, for God, it doesn't matter. What you ate cannot be uh, enclosed in holiness to give you holy energy to do then a mitzvah. 
in and of itself. Of course, the tshuva, we're not, we're not talking about the tshuva here, right? Just bringing out the intent versus the action. Just to maybe give a, a metaphor to help with this. It's a metaphor, it doesn't bring it to you, but, uh, you know, if you ate something poisonous, and you ate it with the full intent to have energy from this food to serve God, it's poisonous, well, you're still going to get some kind of, you know, um, poisoning your your system. Whether, God forbid, it will kill, the, kill you or just, you know, put you into bed, <laughs> uh, you know, sick, whatever it'll be, right? Your intent was positive. It doesn't take away from the fact that this food, you know, had the E. coli in it or whatever. Right? That's poisonous. The same thing is when it comes to kosher food. It doesn't make a difference. It is bound to extraneous forces. In and of itself cannot be elevated. Again, the chuba we spoke about previously. But we're just comparing it to the intent. It's captive to sitaracha to three unclean lipas, and therefore the energy is not going to be elevated. So what comes out is, for a Jew, there are two types of uh, evil inclination. There's the evil inclination for forbidden things. That's called like the, you know, the, the uh, it's called a non-Jewish demon inside you. Because a non-Jew, you know, it's not forbidden. You know, BLT and anything else, it's not kosher, right? It's not forbidden. So it's a non-Jewish demon in you. That's what the non-Jew has a desire for. Well, if you have it. But then there's the Jewish demon in you. Which means those things are permissible for the Jew. That you also desire and you have a lust for. It's permissible stuff. But once you engage in it, not for a sake to elevate it, with the Jewish demon in you, right? And by the way, food is really a Jewish demon because there's so many areas in Jewish life that are not permissible, right? That are not permissible. One area that's permissible is food. So that's a struggle. Now, even though it's permitted food and then you could maybe afterwards have proper intent to use the food as a vehicle to serve rather than be served, right? This, the, is the food serving me, meaning my palate, my pleasure, or am I serving through the food? Hashem. So the fact that a person repents and elevates the energy of the food to holiness afterwards, there's still a trace that remains attached to the person's body, becomes their flesh and blood, meaning there's still some form of negativity, generally speaking, in the tshuva that we will be most likely doing. Which won't be from the depths of the heart. A completely transformation. But regular tshuva. And hence, since there's still a minor stain still there, as a result, after the 120 years in our lifetime, God willing, 120, or whatever our 120 is, the body needs to go or the soul, the body needs to go through a purification. Right? For those things that were permitted and we, you know, had pleasure in them. We didn't use them for the sake of serving, but we used it for self-serving, pleasurable ends, which I have and you have, we all have. Right? Right? 
unless you're like Rabbeinu HaKadosh, Yehuda the Prince, the author of the Mishnah, as before he passed away, he was an extremely wealthy person and had all the pleasures in life available. And yet he said, I did not have to the extent of a small little pinky a pleasure from anything that I had. In other words, a pleasure as an end in itself. He didn't. So such a person doesn't need to go through cleansing. So the righteous don't need to go through a cleansing. But you and I, we need to go through a cleansing. That's called Gehenna, purgatory. Some people call it hell, whatever you want to call it. But as we mentioned before, it's only a means to be cleansed, just like a bath that a child gets uh, dirty and playing in, in the sand, in the mud, and the hair is twisted, and and your, your mother needs to comb out the hair of her daughter um, and you know needs to scrub to get out the dirt it's out of love to bring cleansing and that's what god does to us to our body to our soul um, that's necessary after 120 from the things that were directed not to him that's in food for example how about in speech that, that's action in other words, food meaning acts, actions in our lives. How about our words? So even idle chatter, that's not meaning idle chatter, you didn't say anything wrong, you know, just spoke about the weather. If it's not directed towards heaven, If it's not directed towards heaven, then it's idle chatter. Now, if you need to know the weather, so you know what, how to, what to wear to go outside, so you, you know, you shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't get cold or whatever the case may be. So that might not be idle chatter, but you know, we always speak about the weather because you know, it's always a topic of conversation that uh, can include anybody and everybody. But it's idle chatter. For that, we will also be called into questioning after 120. What do you mean, idle chatter? The greatest commodity that God gives us in our lives is time. There's nothing greater than time. And not to use time to engage in chatter, idle chatter. So we've wasted time for that we will also need to be cleansed that will be called the hollow of the sling hollow of the sling, like a like a sling it goes back and forth and what that means is we will be shown the truth that how every moment is sacred every moment is a, a function that could be used in divine service and then we'll be shown how we used this moment and that moment and the other moment and so on and that will be pain painful for the soul to realize that you've been given an opportunity by god that you could use that moment in a uh, beautiful way right So that will, be, that will be painful for the soul to experience. Now, that's only idle talk. If we speak ill, we speak Lashon Hara, we speak forbidden speech, or scoffing and slander and the like, which comes from, you know, idle chat comes from Klippas Neiga. This comes from Shalosh Klippas is from completely evil place. That won't be sufficient, the hollow of the sling. Now we'll need a little deeper cleansing of the soul. Um, and that is called Gehenna, purgatory. Now, the, the metaphor is either 
it's a very hot place or it's a very cold place. Of course, it's only a metaphor to bring out. Is what caused me coldness to godliness or the passion to of lust that brought me to it? Depending on what brought me to it, that will be the what needs to be purged. Purgatory means to purge out that stain, that negativity that uh, led me to scoff, to slander, and the like. And finally, the last thing is in thought. So we have actions, like in food. We have speech, like in idle chatter and slander and scoffing and so on. And then finally, we have in thought. So in the area of thought means intellectual discipline of the nations of the world, right? In other words, they are also you know, learning about history. You say, what's wrong? Well, it's not unto God, perhaps. And that's the issue. Is there any way that you're serving God with this or not? Or let's say just, you know, biology. Nothing wrong with biology per se. I don't mean, you know, Darwinism to learn. I'm talking about regular biology. Even that's a question. Why? In a certain way, it's even worse than idle chatter to learn biology. I don't just give biology or math or whatever it is. It's even worse than idle chatter in a certain way. Because idle chatter comes from your heart. Learning these disciplines is affecting your mind. So what's wrong with math? What's wrong with... It depends. If you're learning math as an end in itself, or you're learning math or biology or history as part of your service of God. If it's part of the service of God, and thought. And we learned that from Maimonides, Rambam, and Nachmanides, Ramban, that they studied those areas. They studied the sciences. But they did it in a manner that was part of serving God. They did it in order that they can have an awareness, a knowledge in those areas, so they could serve God better. So, for example, I, I you know, um, <laughs> try in those in certain areas to become a little more aware because that awareness will help me in appreciating sometimes even what I'm learning in Tanya. It's going to be a greater appreciation in Tanya. So then learn it in order that you can now appreciate more its teachings. So it might be something in psychology, it might be something about the human condition, whatever the case may be, um, it's you know part of serving Hashem. When it's excluded from it and the pursuit is only for its own uh, for its own end, then that's becomes a question, an issue, because then it's in purifying your mind. Because it's not like an axe, you know, that is used to, um, you know, you, it's an axe to, you're <coughs> to grind, rather than an axe to chop down a tree. But it's a means to an end. So, for example, if you're studying, you know, mathematics so you can become an accountant, so then you're doing it <coughs> for a livelihood. <coughs> Excuse me. For a livelihood. So through a livelihood, you can raise your family and give charity and, and do good. You can do good. So that's part of serving God. But if you're just doing it as an axe to grind, like, you know, I, or I know that's a good expression here, <coughs> but not as a means for a higher purpose, but just out of the pleasure that you have <coughs> in itself. And then just study Torah. At least for a Jew, that's the mitzvah, right?
then study Torah. Because in that, you have the service of God. But in the other thing, it's um, self-serving. So there we have to be careful. Because again, because even idle chatter, it's really coming from, you know, your heart rather than your mind. And to uh, impurify your mind is the worst thing. Because from your mind, then that will affect your heart. That's why, hmm, what divine providence. Tonight is Nittelnacht, a night that we don't study Torah. From sunset onwards. Because of the unholiness of the day. <laughs> Not only just unholiness, but what this day brought to the Jewish people the last 2,000 years. How many people, Jews lost their lives because of an individual who in his name massacred thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews. Nothing to do with Hamas and Islam. The sister religion. That we conclude chapter eight. A question I a question has: Are these online classes and talks, and despite the physical distance, are they considered as purgatory? Huh? I'm, I'm not. I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. If you can, yeah, this is the only day that we don't study Torah unless someone is um, a, a oval, a mourner. So during the Shiva, you don't study Torah either, or only certain parts you can study. You can't just re- study that which brings gladness of heart. But this is, is strictly across the board. Tisha B'av, National Day of Morning, so we don't. Um, learn. Yeah. Thank you, Cherries. Welcome from Israel. That's why there won't be a Torah studies class tonight. I think I'm going to make it Tuesday night. Tuesday night we're going to have Torah studies, not tonight. Uh, TRC will depending on what people want. Yeah. Okay. Another question. In the time of Mashiach, how will we still studying in the sciences when all is revealed? Hmm. The sciences are only a means to an end. To have an awareness of you know if you literally have a leaf in front of you and not that you could here in Montreal right now there's no leaves they're all dead <laughs> right but if you would have a leaf and you'd study botany to understand how photosynthesis works and how all that then you could see the, the marvel in the nature of this world and therefore to appreciate God in this world. That's beautiful to do that. That's amazing. But we have Torah to do that. That's even infinitely greater. Because Torah is not a means to knowing God. Studying Torah is knowing God. Right? Is knowing God. So when you have that, you don't need the science to be able to do that.
Uh, what if I already read Torah? Okay, don't worry about it. Some other questions here. Can we recite Tehillim Davin tonight? We Davin, yes. It's only tonight till midnight, by the way. Only till midnight tonight. So, you know, say Tehillim before. Say Tehillim before. An, uh, another is Tisha B'Av, yes. Yes, Mordechai, correct. We've all missed out of time using wisely. <laughs> yeah. We have. Don't get don't be feel guilty. We've all done it. Okay. 